It knows its morality to be imperfect because it is affected by the sense nature and nature opposed to it, which in part adulterate morality itself as such, and in part give rise to a host of duties by which in concrete cases of real action, it is embarrassed. For each case is the concrescence of many moral relations, just as an object of perception in general is a thing of many properties. And since the specific duty is a purpose, it has a content, and its content is part of the purpose, and morality is not pure. This latter, therefore, has its reality in another being. This reality, however, means nothing else than that the being of morality here is both intrinsic and explicit. Explicit, that is, it is the morality of a conscious being. And intrinsic, that is, it has an existence and a reality. In that first imperfect consciousness, morality is not realized. There it is the in itself, or merely implicit being in the sense of a mere thought being, for it is associated with nature and sense, with the reality of being and consciousness, which constitutes its content. And nature and sense are morally nothing. In the second consciousness, morality exists as perfect and not a, as an unrealized thought thing. But this perfection consists precisely in morality having reality in a consciousness, as well as a free reality and existence in general, in being something not empty, but fulfilled, full of content. That is, the perfection of morality is placed in the fact that what has just been characterized as morally nothing is present in it and intrinsic to it. On the one hand, it is supposed to have validity simply and solely as the unreal thought thing of pure abstraction, and then again equally to have no validity in that mode. Its truth is supposed to consist in its being opposed to reality and to be entirely free and empty of it, and then again to consist in its being reality. We've now reached paragraph 630, the penultimate paragraph in this section, dissemblance or duplicity. And what we see Hegel doing here in this paragraph is reintroducing on the side of the perfect moral being or the holy will, whatever it is that we're projecting beyond ourselves, reintroducing a kind of agency and even personality. Here he's talking in terms of consciousness, um, but uh, that's what's going along with it because he talks about this as, as something that's free. Introducing this into what he had just previously revealed to us as a unconscious, unbewusstlos, abstraction. So you might say, well, what's going on here? Didn't Hegel just show us that we, we've gone through all these dialectical explorations of the moral consciousness and these, this on this side, this on this side. And in every case, we have these two thoughts that we're unable to bring together into some sort of genuine synthetic concept, begriff, but instead we have a Vorstellung, a representation for, that is also, if we want to play on words, a Verstellung, a dissemblance, Yes, he did in fact do that, but now we're leading into the next section, which is uh, about conscious, uh, conscience, the beautiful soul, evil, and its forgiveness. And so we're going to have a, a centering on the moral person having gone through this transformation. And by this point in the phenomenology, a transformation like this, or if you want to use the term that Hegel actually does employ so often a sublation, an aufhebung, a transformation that incorporates. Um, that's something that we've seen happen over and over again. By now, you should expect that whatever impasse we reached is going to be surpassed. So he tells us here that it, what is it? The moral consciousness. In fact, the moral consciousness, you could say, is overarching both of these sides now. And the moral consciousness, he says, knows its morality to be imperfect. Why? Because it is, as we've talked about so much here, affected by what, what uh, is being translated by Miller as sense nature. It's really the same term, Zinlichkeit. So you could just say sense or sensibility or the sense faculty or all that goes with being a sensuous being. 
and nature, nature, opposed to it, opposed to morality, right? Which he says in part adulterate morality itself as such. And then they also give rise to a host of specific duties, uh, a, a whole, you know, coterie or uh, uh, you could say a, a myriad of different duties that we have. And here Hegel doesn't just talk about duties as such. He talks about relations or relationships, but um, ways in which we are connected with somebody else or something else, perhaps even an abstraction like a promise that we, we have made. So he says that we have a host of duties which in concrete cases of real action, it is embarrassed by. And why is it embarrassed by these? Well, as we've seen already, none of these duties is by itself pure duty, eine Pflicht, right? Each one of them is ein besonderes, a specific duty, that pertains just to this particular case or perhaps to cases of this sort, but not to everybody. And yet they are duty. And we're finding ourselves unable to bring them all under one single, unified, workable concept. So he says that in each case, we have the concrescence, the bringing together, the growing together uh, of many moral relations of specific moral relations, just as an object of perception. Notice the analogy that he's giving here is in general, a thing of many properties. So think back to the section, the thing and its properties, which came right after the uh, very first section in what you might call the epistemological beginnings of consciousness. Right? We had sense certainty, and then we had the thing and its relations, and then after that, the very complicated force of the understanding. Well, the thing and its relations, the thing has all of these connections with, with uh, the thing and its properties has all of these uh, connections with consciousness itself. So he says, um, here we go. Just as an object of perception is a thing of many properties, since the specific duty, the, the specific obligation is a purpose, an end, a goal, a zweck in German, it has a content. It has an inhalt. There is something there. We can say, well, it's about this. Here's how we do this sort of thing. That's how we learn our duties in real life, isn't it? We don't learn them by somebody handing us a book of Kant and saying, read the second critique. That'll straighten you out just, just fine. No, we, we say, well, this is your duty today, and here's what you're supposed to do. And, oh, you screwed that up. What you should have done is this. And we go on from there. And that's how we learn these things. And that's still where we're rooted, for the most part, in trying to explore the dynamics of morality. So he goes on and he says, um, because this content, this inhalt, what it contains is part of the purpose, part of the end, part of the goal, what it would be in order to be fulfilled, it is not perfect. And here, if we were looking at the, the, you know, the German language and thinking about it in, in somewhat, we could say, Aristotelian terms, we would see a lot of things jumping out at us. In order to be perfect, you know, the German for that is vollendet. And it's very similar to the word that we use in, in Greek to denote perfect as well. In, in English, we often think of perfect as like lacking any flaws. And we have forgotten the more active sense of perfection, perfectioning. That is getting something closer and closer and closer to what its fullness would be. It, it's, it's full, right? Full end it. It's final end. It's being brought to fruition, as we say, which is almost a better translation, a, you know, fruitionized rather than perfect. And the very fact that we have an end and that our duty is aiming at an end means that in a certain sense, it should be perfect, right? If we fulfill the duty completely, we satisfy that end and the end is made real. It's made actual. 
But Hegel's saying, well, no, it's, it's not entirely. So he says the latter, this is the morality, therefore has its reality in another being. And we've gone through what this other being looks like. Now, here he pauses and he says, this reality means nothing else than that the being of morality, and again, the translation is a little bit misleading here because Miller chooses to use the, the terms intrinsic and explicit rather than um, just using the you know, more straightforward in and for itself. It is the morality of a conscious being, for itself, a being that actually relates itself to itself. And it is intrinsic. And, and here he says it has an existence and a reality. Now, we've been using this term reality or actuality quite a lot throughout the entire phenomenology and especially in this section, the, the entire spirit section. We've talked a lot about that. I don't need to go into that any further. That's Wirklichkeit. So it is making morality Wirklich, right? Existence is Dasein. Here he's not talking about a Wesen, an essence, or a being in some sense, which could be an abstract being. Here he's talking about Dasein, actually being out there in the world. When we use this term existence, you know, the X is often overlooked. What's the difference between existence and being? We don't have to go too far into the metaphysics there. There's a lot of discussion of that in medieval philosophy, right? But here's one thing that you can say. Existere means to like stand out, to, to be there, as we say for Dasein. So that's worth thinking about for, for just a moment. So he goes on and he says, in that first imperfect consciousness, morality is not realized. It's not brought to its fruition. It's not made completely actual. So he says, there it's the in itself or merely implicit being in the sense of being a mere thought being. And when we saw this with the perfect uh, holy will that doesn't really exist, that we can aspire towards and maybe take as sort of a, an end point for guidance, we aim at that, but it doesn't really exist. And, it, and it's a projection coming out of ourselves. Hegel goes on further and he says, um, there it's the in itself, Merely implicit being in the sense of mere thought being. Why? Because it's associated with nature and sense. With the reality of being and consciousness, which constitutes its content, and nature and sense are morally nothing. Insofar as we reduce morality, we, we completely naturalize it, you might say, Hegel would say, we lose sight of what morality is really about. And... This is an important thing in, in the development. This is an important realization in the development of moral consciousness. Now, what about the other side? So he says, in the second consciousness, and what we've projected beyond ourselves, morality exists as perfect, as brought to fruition, as fulfilled, as entirely what it's supposed to be, and not as an unrealized thought thing. But what does this perfection mean, Hegel says? What does perfection of this sort require? He says, well, it consists precisely in morality having, notice two things he's saying here, having reality, having wirklichkeit, actuality, in a consciousness. Not by itself, not as an ideal, not as something purely abstract, in a consciousness. And you could really say, without a consciousness, there is no morality, period, a at any point. We, we project this idea of a morality, like something we could talk about in a book or, you know, again, create a video about and have lots of words about. But unless it exists for a consciousness, there is no morality there. Co morality is something that is, you might say, part of the fabric of consciousness, human consciousness, not necessarily other consciousness per se, but human consciousness, certainly. So he goes on and he says, uh, it has reality in a consciousness as well as a free reality. This is very important. It has the possibility of doing otherwise. Again, 
that can't be that holy will that we talked about before that always does the right thing, almost like a robot or a god. It's got to be a, somebody like us who has, actually has to struggle. So he says, an existence in general, being something not empty, but fulfilled, full of content. So he says, this means the perfection of morality is placed in the fact that just what has been characterized as morally nothing uh, you know, what is morally nothing? Sense and nature is present in it and intrinsic to it, is essential to it. So he says, on the one hand, it's supposed to have validity simply and solely as this unreal thought thing of pure abstraction, which we talked about in the previous paragraphs, and then to have no validity in that mode. Its truth is supposed to consist in its being opposed to reality and to be entirely free and empty of it. And then again, to consist in it being reality. So we have this, again, a dualism where we're not able to bring both sides together. And we still don't completely know what morality would be for us. The syncretism of these contradictions, which is set forth at length in the moral view of the world, collapses internally, since the distinction on which it rests, the distinction between what must be thought and postulated and yet is at the same time not essential, becomes a distinction which no longer exists even in words. What finally is posited as diverse, both as a nothing and also as a reality, is one and the very same thing, that is, existence and reality, and what is supposed to be absolute only as the beyond of real being and consciousness, and yet equally to be absolute only in them, and so as a beyond to be nothing. This absolute is pure duty, and the knowledge of duty as essence. The consciousness which makes this distinction that is no distinction, which asserts that actual existence has no validity and at the same time that it is real, that pure morality is both truly essential and also devoid of essence, such a consciousness expresses in one and the same breath the thoughts which it previously separated and itself proclaims that it is not in earnest about this determination and separation of the moments of self and in itself or intrinsic being, but that, on the contrary, what it asserts as having absolute being outside of consciousness, it really keeps enclosed within the self of self-consciousness, and that what it asserts to have absolute being in thought, or to be absolutely intrinsic being, it for that very reason takes to be something that has no truth. Consciousness comes to see that the placing a part of these moments is a displacing of them, a dissemblance, and that it would be hypocrisy if, nevertheless, it were to keep them separate. But as moral, pure self-consciousness, it flees from this disparity between the way it thinks of these moments and of its own essential nature, flees from this untruth which asserts that to be true, which it holds to be untrue, flees from this with abhorrence back into itself. It is a pure conscience which rejects with scorn such a moral idea of the world. It is in its own self the simple spirit that certain of itself acts conscientiously regardless of such ideas, and in this immediacy possesses its truth. While, however, this world of dissemblance is nothing else but the development of moral self-consciousness in its moments, and hence is its reality, its essential nature by retreating into itself will not become anything different. Its retreat into itself means rather that consciousness has realized that its truth is a pretended truth. It would always have to be giving out this pretended truth as its truth, for it would have to express and present itself as an objective idea, but would be aware that all this is merely a dissemblance. It would therefore be, in fact, hypocrisy. And the scornful rejection of that dissemblance would be itself the first expression of hypocrisy. Paragraph 631 brings this section, dissemblance or duplicity, Verstellung, to a close. This is the second to last subsection of this massive spirit portion of the work. And we are now ready to go into the new discussion of conscience and the beautiful soul and evil and its forgiveness that will bring morality to its 
full conclusion within the Hegelian dialectic. And this is very important because we're getting closer and closer and closer, not just to the end of this section, but to the end of this work. And so we're getting closer to a concrete understanding of spirit or consciousness having developed over time through human beings struggling to make sense out of things. And in this case, it's the moral consciousness, which is not completely finished, but we've gone through an important stage. So here Hegel talks about syncretism, right? And when we see this term, it often comes up within a religious context where what we're thinking about is blending different religions together, uh, taking a ritual of one religion and placing it within the framework of another religion, finding some ways to make them, you know, connect up with each other, doing some comparative work. And what we're doing here is somewhat like that, except it's not religions that we're looking at. It's rather, we might say, world perspectives. Well, Weltanschauung, right? Uh, where we are looking at a moral view of the world and how we can assimilate it to all the other things that matter to us. And he says that we have a syncretism of these contradictions. One, one of the problems with syncretism is that you're taking things that are in fact contradictory or at least appear to be contradictory and you're trying to say, no, 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 they can all be brought together in one full perspective that, that makes sense out of all of them. And what we see here is Yes, we do in fact make sense out of all of these dichotomies and distinctions that we've been exploring here, but we make sense of it precisely by saying what we were doing was actually mixed up. What we were engaging with was verging on being, as Hegel is going to call it here, a type of hypocrisy. And then we have to think about where are we going to go after this? So he says, the syncretism uh, is set forth in the moral view of the world. It collapses internally. And he's discussing how this collapse or flight, as he's going to call it a little bit later on in this section, in this paragraph, how does that, that happen? It collapses internally. Why? The distinction on which it rests, the distinction between what must be, what must be thought and postulated on the one hand, what consciousness has to somehow have going on, at least in, in you know, its imagination or its hopes and dreams, and at the same time, what is not essential, what is not real, what is not actual. So this becomes a distinction which no longer exists even in words. That's a strong statement. The distinction, we could say, well, it's a merely verbal distinction. Hegel here is saying, Ah, even that distinction, you quit even talking about it. Th that's an advance. Sometimes silence about things is the result not of not knowing, but of saying, well, we've already done that and it didn't work. So he says, um, what is finally posited as diverse, both as a nothing and as also a reality, is one and the very same thing. That is existence and reality. What is supposed to be absolute only as the beyond of real being and consciousness, the ideally perfect holy will that always fulfills moral duty, right? That recognizes pure duty. Uh, we, we come to the point where we see that um, he says, is equally to be absolute only in them, and so as a beyond to be nothing. We're, we're dealing here with a dialectic that gets to the very root of the metaphysical distinction between the absolute and nothing, or being and nothingness. And showing us that in some respect, at least in this issue, they're not radically different from each other. So he goes on and he says that the absolute is pure duty and the knowledge of duty as essence. So the consciousness, the moral consciousness, the human being who makes this distinction that is no distinction, which asserts that actual existence has no validity and at the same time it is real, that pure morality is both truly essential and also devoid of essence. We're running into contradictions here right now. 
uh, beyond merely distinctions, we have real contradictions, as we've been talking about in the previous paragraphs. Such a consciousness, he says, expresses in one and the same breath the thoughts which are previously separated. And here we get to the duplicity or dissemblance, right? The Verstellung. Why? He says, it's showing that it's not in earnest. It's not being honest with itself and others about this determination and separation of the moments of what? Self and in itself. It's making all sorts of very interesting distinctions, but these distinctions ultimately are breaking down. None of them are able to support the weight, you might say, or to rise to the heights, if you want a different metaphor, of morality. Morality, in a certain sense, escapes our attempts to conceptualize it. And by conceptualize, I don't mean to just simply form a concept in the sense of have an idea of it or say some words about it, but to have what Hegel would call a concept, a begriff, a living, dynamic grasp of the totality of these things in relation to each other, how they function. Instead, what we have is a kind of corrosion going on. And he says, on the contrary, what it asserts is having absolute being outside of consciousness. It really keeps enclosed within the self of self-consciousness. As I've been saying throughout many of these paragraphs, the, the beyond and this is a typical Hegelian move, the beyond in which the being in itself, the holy will, the perfect morality, the uh, anything else that you want to, to put in there is superlative. It's a projection on the part of consciousness. It's just as much a projection as it was way back when we were looking at the unhappy consciousness, which saw itself as nothing and the eternal as everything. Whatever is fully moral in this case is, is something belonging to that imperfect moral self-consciousness which projects it beyond and uses it to judge itself. So he says, what it asserts to have absolute being in thought or to be absolutely intrinsic being, it for that very reason takes to be something that has no truth. And notice that Hegel uses the term truth, Wahrheit here. Uh, something that he's not used through most of this section. He says, consciousness comes to see the placing apart, the auseinanderstellen, the setting in, in, in different places, or, or setting one over here and then pulling the other one away from it and saying, you belong over here. This auseinanderstellen, right, out of each other setting, this placing apart of the two moments that are being distinguished from each other is really a Verstellung, a dissemblance or duplicity. And, and uh, Miller has a very nice way of uh, adding a little bit here. He says that consciousness comes to see the placing apart is a displacing of them, a dissemblance. The displacing and dissemblance translating the same term Verstellung, right? So he says, it would be hypocrisy if it were to keep them separate. Well, this is an advance, is it not? It would be hypocrisy if it were to keep them separate and pretend like, well, this is, this is you know, what we have as morality. Instead, it has to go further and realize how things are and admit it. So he says, as moral self-consciousness, it flees from this disparity between the way it thinks of these moments and its own essential nature. It flees, this is a beautiful line, it flees from this untruth which asserts that to be true which it holds to be untrue. What is the essence of hypocrisy? It is pretending that something untrue is in fact true. It's sort of parasitical upon the truth. So the person who, if, you know, we take, uh, you know, traditional uh, portrayals of, of the hypocrite, the person who, well, let's talk about morality, right? Condemns the immorality of their neighbors while engaging in the very same thing themselves. There is a truth there in the condemnation. They shouldn't behave that way. 
Um, they shouldn't uh, say have loud parties late at night, keeping everybody up. But then you're, you know, in your apartment having an equally loud party, and you're just unhappy because you weren't invited to that, that other party, right? Then you're a hypocrite. And there is a truth there, but it's a truth that convicts everybody. Instead, fleeing from hypocrisy would mean saying, wow, I'm a terrible neighbor myself. I got to knock this crap off instead of worrying about whether they're having a loud party. First, I got to get my own appetites under control. And uh, then after a while, I'll go over and knock on their door and say, hey, it's three in the morning. Uh, maybe you should tone it down a little bit. In this case, we're talking about something much broader. I just use that as a specific example. So he says, this moral self-consciousness flees from the untruth, flees from this with abhorrence back into itself. So how does it flee? Hegel tells us, it is a pure conscience which rejects with scorn such a moral ideal of the world. It is in its own self the simple spirit that's certain of itself. Notice, it is gewissheit, certainty of itself, acts conscientiously regardless of what ideas. Instead of trying to make sense of all this, it says, damn it, I know what the right thing to do is. I'm going to fulfill my duties. And if I can't make sense out of all of this, if, if these distinctions that I introduced are really just gumming the works up, I have to go back into myself and be a good person. So he goes on and he says, um, in this immediacy, it possesses its truth. So then he says, while this world of dissemblance is nothing else but the development of moral self-consciousness in its moments, and hence is its reality, its essential nature, by retreating into itself will not become anything different. So what we have here is, again, a sublation. We are incorporating and stripping away and reducing and moving beyond, right? Uh, this is what Aufhebung consists in. That's why we're moving to another shape of consciousness, so he goes on and he says, um, it's retreat into itself means consciousness has realized that its truth is a pretended truth. Its truth, its truth that it's conscious of is a pretended truth. There is still, still truth out there, but the truth is that it's a liar, that it is a hypocrite, that it, it has to become something greater than what it currently is. So he says, it would, have to, it would always have to be giving out this pretended truth as its truth, for it would have to express and present itself as an objective idea, but it would be aware that this is merely a dissemblance. And we've seen this before, haven't we? In the discussion earlier in spirit with the culture section and the person who becomes conscious of how much of this is all just BS, and nevertheless, it has to be lived up to in some way. And so we talk the talk and we play the game, all the while knowing that there has to be something more, something better, something truer than that. So he goes on and he says, it would therefore be in fact hypocrisy and the scornful rejection of that dissemblance would be itself the first expression of that hypocrisy. We are placed in a situation similar to that which led to a kind of madness, an irtum, right? A wandering on the part of the person of culture that then led us to something further with faith and pure insight. Now we have a different transition to make to this, you know, conscience and at least the attempt to have a beautiful soul. So that's where we're going next.